Um, so my name is Faraz Hoodboy. Uh, I am uh, one of the charter members of Open. Uh, I'm one of the founders of a company called Pixense, which uh, I sold in 2011. And today I now work at a big company, work for AT&T, uh, running their innovation outreach. Um, and you know, if you're asking yourself, why does an entrepreneur go join a big company? Um, the, if you didn't attend the last session, the, the answer is very simple. It's my wife's fault. Um, she, uh, uh, after selling the company, I was enjoying retirement for a year. Um, my, I, I got a call one day from AT&T saying that I had applied for a job. I hadn't. It was my wife. Um, and that's how I uh, ended up here. So I, at AT&T, at I uh, work with uh, external startups and innovators. I meet about, with about 500 to 600 companies a year. Um, look at their technologies, see where, whether or not uh, it makes sense for AT&T to take a position in them, whether we should connect them with some of our business units, or you know, give them a straight answer that, no, it doesn't fit. Um, so, so we try to be pretty honest and open about it. Um, and one of the things of being, you know, working in a, in a very large network provider is you, you start to see um, that you know, there's a lot of technology that's now starting to reach its maturation. And our previous panel in the last session, uh, in the last track, was was really focused around the the simultaneous maturation of the Internet of Things, uh, of uh, uh, virtualization and cloud computing, and of uh, the the uh, uh, mobility networks or ubiquitous network connectivity showing up across the board. Um, and what we're starting to see, what we're trying to do now, and much of our uh, conversations in Open Forum are, are going to be uh, thematically linked around this, but we're, we're going to spend right now spending a lot of time understanding around the opportunities of the Internet of Things and specifically around um, the sweet spot of the analytics of that rich data set that, that, that all of these connected sensors are starting to bring. And we've assembled, I think, a, a fantastic panel, one that I'm absolutely honored and delighted to be here with. So um, we have uh, Ayaz Ghazi. And uh, Ayaz, would you be kind enough to um, help us uh, uh, know a little bit about your, your background as well, please? Thanks, Faraz. Uh, hi, everyone. Good morning. Salaam alaikum. Uh, hope everyone is doing well. Uh, I work for SAP around the platform strategy and adoption. And uh, I've been with SAP now eight years and have been in the middleware uh, tech background all along before this. A developer at heart, product manager, product marketing, product strategy, bring all that trifecta together and sort of essentially uh, been thinking more on the tech strategy and driving forward new products and incub incubating new ideas at SAP and uh, been one of the early core members, so startup, if you will, within SAP uh, for a platform called HANA. And currently, I drive, uh, as part of what I do, the, a large number of startups I see. Aurangzeb from Altia has just walked in to grace us with his presence, one of the early guys who pitched us to be part of the HANA startup program. So we have about 1,500 startups right now. Quite a few of these are. Uh, 1,500 IoT. that you've invested in, or 1,500, 1500 that startups that we enable on our platform. Okay. There's a separate sister company, SAP Ventures, that invests in these, and they tend to do middle to late stage. And uh, we have about 75 products that are available for sale on the platform through these startups. Very cool. So the, uh, why are we doing this? We are investing in companies of tomorrow. We are investing in trends of tomorrow. We are investing in companies that will buy from these companies of tomorrow. And Frankly, a platform's not a platform unless others build on it. Fair enough. So. Fair enough. Um, thank you, and we're, we're delighted to have you here. And, um, Kelly Schwager, you are the Chief Marketing Officer at Streetline. Um, and uh, uh, full disclosure, Zia Youssef is one of our charter members, uh, one of the uh, people who was former president of, of the Open Chapter, um, is the founder and CEO, or sorry, the CEO of that company. Um, and uh, he was, you know, in case you're wondering on the program, it's listed as Zia. I'm not Zia. I'm like Faraz. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly is, is, is representing uh, Streetline. So thank you for being here. And tell us a little bit about your perspective uh, coming in from, I, I believe you were at SAP before and now at, at, at Streetline. So yeah, absolutely. love to hear that story. Yeah, so first of all, it's an absolute pleasure to be with you here today. And on behalf of Zia, he wanted to wish, his, wish you all his best. Um, so I've had the pleasure of knowing IOZ for quite some time. Um, I worked with both Zia and IOZ for quite a while at SAP and actually left the comforts of the large, you know, global, very stable company to jump into the startup world. 
Um, so I joined Streetline around the same time that Zia did um, with the intent of taking the very cool technology that the company had been developing and driving the go-to-market strategy. So if you're not familiar with Streetline, what we do is we have sensor technology that we go out there, we put into the quote-unquote real world. The first several years of the company was really spent perfecting the technology, looking at how you can put sensors into our city streets to withstand the elements. So, you know, snow plows and trucks and snow and rain and, you know, vandalism. Um, and really understanding how do you have technical devices out there that can really withstand the unknown. Um, so the first few years were really spent on the sensor technology. When Zia and I joined, um, the idea was to figure out what markets, what use cases, could we actually build a business around. And so the, f the initial use case has been focused on parking. Um, we did not ever dream that we would be working for a parking company, but um, parking has turned out to be a very inter interesting use case to prove out the real value of the Internet of Things because it's something that almost everybody can relate to. I'm sure all of you can relate to driving in circles looking for that place to park. I'm sure that there are restaurants you choose not to go to because parking is a hassle. Mm -hmm. In a city, parking is typically the second or third largest revenue source. So it's a huge, important issue for city leaders. For merchants, it's also a key pain point. Um, there's a lot of merchants that actually choose their location based on the availability and turnover of parking. So the last few years, we've really gone out there to try to prove the model, um, look at how we can use this very cool data that we're capturing from our city streets specifically related to parking, and we push that information to a variety of different applications. So for the city, we can provide them real-time data about what's actually happening on their city streets. Um, parking is an important real estate asset for these cities. There's a lot of real estate dedicated to where we park. And cities need to manage that effectively and understand if they're actually allocating it appropriately. Do they have enough? Do they have too much? Are they pro you know, pricing it correctly? For consumers, we can push that information to apps. So we have our own app, but we also have APIs where others can integrate the data into their apps or into websites. Um, for merchants, extremely valuable information. So in some of the cities that we've gone into, we've actually been able to show how by making parking less of a you know, friction and, and making it easier, how merchant revenue can go up, which then impacts sales tax. Um, so it's been a very exciting journey so far. We have a lot of other use cases ahead, and hopefully today in the panel we'll talk a bit more about those other use cases as well. Cool. Thank I you. heard some crazy stat that 30% uh, of the city's congestion is because of people looking for parking. You got it. Yeah, there's a lot of research that's been done, and um, the amount of, of congestion in a city 30% is um, attributed to parking. People looking for parking. And the congestion associated with that, or the pollution associated with that well, as well. Um, we have studies that show by reducing the amount of time it takes to park, you can actually have meaningful impact on CO2 emissions. So there's a lot of, a lot of interesting plays as it relates to parking. Great, thank you. Well, it's a delight to have both of you here. Um, what, you know, what, what I'd like to do is start with sort of the broader questions around the Internet of Things. Um, and, and, you know, as if you could, you know, help us understand from your vantage point, because you're looking at it from the platform side as well, help us understand what, what you broadly characterize as the Internet of Things and what does it mean in the context of SAP? Um, 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 and then having understood that, you know, it's primarily around a lot of the sensors pieces, what are the data elements into it? And again, how does that factor into to what SAP is doing and thinking? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And uh, frankly, the, uh, there's a marketing aspect of uh, a buzzword, Internet of Things. There's a marketing aspect of big data. And you have to always go back to what is the core concept and principle behind it. So Internet of Things, uh, everybody here sort of has an idea, simply put, is when every, everything that you can interact or work with is starting to send you signals and data and messages. And now how do you collect all of that? How do you process all of that? How do you manage all of that? What's the real insight you can get? What's the context you can get? And that's where big data sort of ties in. Internet of Things is kind of a specialized application. So if you think of uh, event condition action, an event happens, a condition is met, and you have to take an action, and you need data to make an insight. So how do you get all of that together? Whether you call it big data, all data, real time with context, or Internet of Things where it's largely devices and you're mashing up data, that's putting all of that together. I think if you look at it from another dimension, today most of the conversations around Internet of Things is from a consumer perspective. And uh, 
there is a fallacy that it's only tied to Google Glasses and some of the other things, and of course sensor devices, etc. But a large portion of this is today consumer. The, the interesting part of it is when you start applying it to the enterprise. And you've seen early work from Amazon with the drones in, in, in their warehouse management. Mm -hmm. SAP is doing the same thing, working with some partners such you as Vuzix. You have drones and, going through in, <laughs> inside of warehouses? We, we work with the field glasses guys, uh, Vuzix and Google, okay. for that matter, to do warehouse management, uh, smart warehouse management. And so you're, you're, you've got flying robots in Not yet. Them? Not okay. yet. Not yet. I mean, have you seen the Amazon video? <laughs> yes, yes. Of of, they don't fly. Yeah, true. They're just, they're just grids. Yes. And they know how to manage uh, moving material around. It's, it's a similar concept, but here we're doing it by imaging okay. in some ways. Of course, there are different approaches to it. Now, the question is, are you applying it to consumer or enterprise? That's the first thing. Any buzzword, any marketing word, if you will, only gets real meaning when the business model changes. Right. And that's the key behind all of this. Today, you're seeing the early work. Uh, what we heard about cloud many, many moons ago, and then came along Salesforce and companies like that that changed the business model. It was never, it's never about just the technical innovation. Sure. That just gives you a head start to start proving out things. It's when you change the business model. So you'll see all those changes starting to come in Internet of Things for field services. Field services is a classic example where you can take glasses and manage on, at the end of the oil rig or if you're out in the field uh, delivering uh, on a delivery truck to be able to manage different things. Uh, in, in fact, even tie into parking. Streetline is a classic example. Who would have thought of parking being one example of the Internet of Things? But it is because you're managing sensor data. Actually, that's 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 a good segue to my next question, which was you know to, to Kelly, which is uh, you know arguably Streetline is is one of the most interesting end-to-end -end solutions of an Internet of Things piece. And, and and I noted that as you were introducing the company, you spent less emphasis on. The, the technologies and the networks and all the pieces that went into it, and more on, hey, this is solving a real problem. We're all focused on uh, driving around and finding different parking spots, or cities make real money from this, which, which I thank you for. Um, but, but I do want to spend a little bit of time on talking about the technologies that go into it. And, and you know, help us understand wh what are the component technologies that had to go in and building this sensor grid or network of sensors mm -hmm. to be able to collect the information that you have and that you're then able to present real value on top of. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, you know, building off of something that I said, Internet of Things can be you know, misconceived as a, a marketing term and, and buzz. And so one of the things that we've really tried to do at Streetline is humanize the technology. It is very sophisticated. It is very complex. Um, and so what we've tried to do is kind of demystify how complex it really is so folks can really start to see the true potential. Um, so what is on, you know, kind of behind the curtain that makes all this work? Um, we have actual sensors. So imagine, if you will, a hockey puck. Um, that's about the size of the sensor. Inside, there's two AA lithium batteries that last for about four and a half, five years. Um, that was part of the IP that really um, you know, the engineers spent a lot of time on because when you have these devices out in city streets, you don't want to be going out there all the time having to swap out batteries. Um, we have... So these are like dust sensors that... that we, yeah, we use uh, the dust network. Um, and so two AA lithium batteries, magnetometer to detect the metal content, temperature sensing, light sensing, and so we can capture lots of different kinds of data, bring this data together, and then push it out via a mesh network. So we, we do work with dust. Um, so the network is kind of self-healing, if you will. If a truck drives by, the, the sensors are smart enough to be able to find the shortest path back to our data centers. Um, so the network is continuously changing path, continuously trying to find the fastest way back to us. Um, there's also the ability to do over-the-air programming, and so we can continuously update the sensors remotely when we have um, you know, software update dates, when there's a change that needs to be made. And we're continuously monitoring the health of the, the sensors. So imagine, if you will, you know, kind of a, a heartbeat. Um, we know the status of every sensor at every point in the day, um, which is very important to make sure that we're continuously, you know, again, capturing that, that, that data so we can communicate um, information. Um, so the first few years were really spent on trying to get this technology um, up and running, ready for our city streets. And now, for the, the users of the technology, we want to make it as turnkey as possible. So, Ayaz mentioned, you know, this is really starting mm -hmm. to become real when the business model changes. 
we don't go out there and pitch this as a network. We don't go out there and say we're selling sensors. It's offered to our customers as a service. Um, so, you know, just like a, a Salesforce where, you know, software as a service, you subscribe on a monthly basis, this very much operates the same way. Cool. Thank you. Um, so, as actually taking that point of, you know, in information theory, we always have this thing about you've got data that goes to information and goes to wisdom. Um, now, if you look in, in, in a continuous sensor uh, mode, um, my Fitbit is calculating, you know, Every uh, you know every uh, every step I take, um, my you know uh, calculate it helped me figure out that I have sleep apnea because it told me how many times I was waking up in the middle of the night, which is a small data set, but at least enough to mm -hmm. to, to to get you there. Um, but if you take about if you think about it from the concept of like the connected car, a computer that is plugged in and just logging the data that comes out of the ODBT uh, ODB2 uh, uh, port is generating roughly about 10 gigabytes a day. Now, coming from AT&T and uh, as a network provider, if every car in the world starts uploading 10 gigabytes of data a day at $10 a gigabyte, I'm very happy. Mm -hmm. um, but that, we know that that's not going to be the case. So how do you start to collect and sift through all this data? And it's not necessarily true that you can shove all this data into the cloud to do the analytics because, well, I mean, if you do, that's great. I'm very happy. But, but, but tell me how, how, how you're seeing it. it it's, I mean, this is, this is history repeating itself. You're going to come in waves and spurts, go one way, pendulum will swing, swing one way, then the other. Right now, it's all about collecting and centrally uh, sifting through this and providing a platform that can do this, mm -hmm. whether the data collection comes from a street line or wherever else that comes from. And then f figuring out how much of this, how quickly is this changing? Is it meter data that's changing every 15 minutes? Or is it uh, something that's coming every second? And then managing all of that in one place. Now, You've heard of client server. You start went from mainframe to client server to back to today. What we have is really the old mainframe back again in a new, new way, right? Distributed out to everyone in real time. You will see sifting happening and data blending and data cleansing happening at the point of collection for more meaningful data. And of course, there might be other ways to even part that other information. And, and store it so that uh, when you're so talking about you're distributed backing, systems of I'm storage, talking, storage, that's right. So distributed st systems of storage where you might have eventually eventually upload the other data that you didn't that you want to throw away, which can go sit in a, in, in technology world in a Hadoop environment, sit on a data lake somewhere, and that you can always come back and plug that back in. So you'll see a lot of these changes. I think we are on very early stages of all of this, and this is actually an exciting time to start looking at uh, data management, start looking at all of the different dimensions of data, figure out what use case. I think the best thing always is to figure out what is the problem that you can solve for a couple of, if you are a startup looking to do these things, and I see this every day with, with the startups that we work with. We have some very interesting startups that are using IoT, if you will, to tell farmers where to plant their crops. Now they're, they're crunching a whole lot of data coming from different meters, devices, uh, weather data, geological data, space data, to be able to tell where and what crop to plant. And in fact, one of the startups in my program uh, started this uh, about two months ago, and then after the month into the program, Monsanto went and bought a similar company for $3 billion. So, I mean, what other validation do you need when, when you're down that path? So the key now is, what are the applications? The platform is ubiquitous to be able to provide that if it can handle all the different dimensions of data. And people get caught up in big data in terms of size, but the harder data to manage is the data that we've been throwing away all these years. There's the little bits of data that's distributed across on people's systems, on laptops that are being stored. It's not really the, a big data problem. It's managing all the aspects of data, big, it's small, medium, large, slowly changing, fast changing, historical. How are you going to derive real-time context if you don't have access to this information? Yeah, that's one of the things I was going to um, build on is the idea that with all of this new technology and the data that's being captured, there's really interesting use cases that take advantage of the real-time data, but the historical data combined with that real-time is just as valuable. So one of the new use cases that we're uh, moving into actually relates to the tracking of temperature data. So in, imagine in snowy areas, in real-time, we know the status of the, surf the road surface temperature in the areas where de we're deployed. If a big storm is coming in or hits, we can direct by street, by block, where to send salt trucks, where to send snow plows. 
in you know. And that's because the sensor has light uh, temperature. Uh, te temperature base. So, temperature data. so how can you tell the temperature of of snow versus ambient temperature just being cold? So um, so the, the there's a difference between the ambient temperature in the air versus the surface level temperature. Cool. Um, and so because our sensors are actually embedded into the pavement, we can tell that difference. And so today when a, a guy, you know, running a fleet of salt trucks or snow plows you know, goes out, they're, you know, yes. <laughs> they're guessing. It's, it's more of a visual. So you've got a recipe driven approach to road salting. So we have an, the ability to get really, really granular, which is a huge savings, you know, both from a labor and a, you know, raw cost perspective for a city. On the opposite end of the spectrum, by having the historical temperature data, you can do things to uh, mitigate heat island effect. So looking at where you can plant trees, because you have, over time, um, that data, and you can look at where you can plant the trees to reduce the temperatures in those warmer climates. So lots of interesting applications of both the real-time aspects and the historic aspects. Let me give you a couple more. Sure, Just please so, do. And these are things that we are working on as SAP, not even the, not even the startups as SAP is doing this. How many of you have been to Dubai? What are the things you see as much as the tall buildings in Dubai? Dust. Dust? The 60 percent of the world's cranes are in Dubai. That's true, too. There's a lot of construction going on there. And uh, we're working with a large construction company that manages most of these cranes. So every aspect, every angle, every motion of the crane is monitored to make sure there's not as many accidents. The dust is, tried, is deport, deposited. In the, when you have so many cranes there. Something's going to fall. Something's going to fall. Something cranes are going to crash. So the, the whole process is now managed uh, directly by this construction so company that's working. management of cranes. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And, and I mean, that's who would have thought of that? And they are actually crunching data that is even stored historically to be able to manage how do these cranes, where do these typically go? When is their downtime? How long can they be down? How long is it okay to keep it down? Turkish Airlines and manages their planes this way. You know, if a if a plane is sitting in in the hangar for a day, it costs them a billion dollars. A million so they, dollars for sitting uh, in the plane. It costs them a lot of money sitting to up. keep a plane in the anger instead of bringing it out of maintenance. Wow. Another example, this is in sports, and we're doing this with the German soccer league, so you can, you can equate it to cricket, and if you, it, it becomes a lot easier to understand, but we have sensors in the shoes of all the players, and they can actually, once the game is done, you can replay an entire game without any video. So just looking at the number of... Just looking at the... And now, more importantly, you can predict the performance, a future performance. So think about when an NFL, NFL draft is going on now. Think about what that means for when you're trying to get your wow. soccer players or cricket players. You can you can predict Based exactly how much. By the way, KKR is using our technology in, in the IPL to be able to do this kind of prediction. So, so uh, for those of you who don't know IPL, it's the... Uh, Indian Premier League. Yeah. Yes. Um, for cricket. So, so, so actually, that, that, that sort of starts to raise another question that, you know, as we start getting all this data out there, um, there, there is an aspect of security tied to it. And mm -hmm. Kelly, I know in the, in, in the parking space it may not matter as much, but, but certainly, you know, if my Fitbit data gets out, I'm kind of upset about it because then everybody knows what I've been up to. Um, but at some level, how does the security start to play into this when you start having all these different sensors out there that, that can potentially have a lot of, you know, personal information based on them? Do I, re you know, the, 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 the players who have got their, um, Soccer motions being tracked. What if that was also extended to their personal time? Would that wouldn't be as much fun for them? I'm imagining. So, so how do you start to protect the data? And as maybe you can talk about that from a security context of of the data around the Internet of Things. I think that's a that's a great point. I mean, it started out even in the cloud world, people are nervous about breaches. I mean, everybody says, well, no, it's all secure, but then there are breaches. Hey, there always will be. Example. And, and that's the process of uh, hardening, if you will. There will always be somebody who will hack into some of these things. As, 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 of, as it's set up, it's not available for people to, to get to. But for the data mine, there will always be a way that they can get to, into it. And every time somebody gets into it, that becomes harder the next time. So it's just a matter, it's just a matter of hardening of the technology and, and growing up. And it's, but, the question is always what benefit do you get, and is it worth the risk? Is, can If I can get a competitive advantage for my business, if I can predict what my players, which players to pick, and if that allows a little bit of the data to be leaked out, uh, which is not intentional, 
Well, if it also it's, tells it's, me that this player was at such and such place, um, getting such and such, uh, where, 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 where it's known that they're getting, um, you know, hormonal uh, changes to, to, to get enhanced performance, that can hurt them as well. So sure. are, are they going to want to go and, and, and have that um, tracked for the first? It, it's the cost of not doing it is a lot more than, the, than worrying about it. There's always reasons to not do something, right? I think and I that's think, an important point. And I think, look, I work for a company that has had that mindset for a long time, and we are the ones who've been changing it now for some time. Fantastic. There's always reasons to not do something. And the question is just go out and do it. If, if you're a Star Wars fan, there is no try. <laughs> there is no do. try, there do or so, do not, exactly. Yeah, well, and I would also say that, um, you know, f as it relates to privacy in particular, um, it is that, that trade-off. If there's value, I do think, you know, particularly in the consumer space, folks are willing to give a certain level of information. So like Fitbit is a great example where you know, you're getting value, so you know, you're, you're willing to let that data flow. Um, but in, but in, take, it, uh, you know, take privacy in the parking context. You now know that because this is this car, you can potentially automate the payments piece, but now you have a record as to where I've been. Yeah, so that's um, one of the things that we've, we've looked at. We know that there was a car. We don't know it's your car. Um, so we don't capture personal information. But you Could had we? to have captured it for payment for processing purposes, right? Um, the if I payment, use my credit yeah, card. The, the credit card provider, the payment provider would know, but okay, we don't so, necessarily. So you're not integrated into that So we, we integrate the technology, but we don't actually handle the payment okay. piece. So it's a pass through. But um, the other thing I was going to say is if you look at things like what Disney is doing around the magic bands, um, it's somewhat controversial because you're you know, asking parents to go on and log in personal information about their children. But so far, the response has actually been quite positive because you lose if your you're, kid at Disneyland, it's pretty scary. Well, it, from a safety perspective or from an experience. Sure. So the trade-off is making a, a better experience for the family at Disneyland. You're, you know, it could be your son's seventh, seventh birthday. His favorite character is Buzz Lightyear. Buzz Lightyear walks up and wishes him a happy birthday. That's kind of cool. Yes. Um, and so I think there, that you're right. There are trade-offs, and people will be willing to, to play if, if there is a benefit that they, you know, that they think is, is worthwhile. Cool. So, so switching gears, and, and a lot of our open members are, uh, some of them are entrepreneurs, many of them are, are technology professionals in big companies, and, and they're all, we're always trying to understand the, the, the choices that people make um, and the decisions that they make in, in, in terms of why they're uh, going away, and, and you had a phenomenal career at, at, at SAP. What possessed you to go join a startup, and that too in the yeah. parking space of all things? <laughs> and and yeah. knowing what you now know, would you do it again? So, I, yeah, I, I did not grow up ever dreaming I would land in the parking industry, so um, it definitely was, I think, a shock to not only my family, but many of my peers that I was leaving the comforts of SAP to, to go on this journey. Um, I absolutely loved my time at SAP. It was, you know, it was fabulous. But the, the, opportun the reason the opportunity really sparked my interest is because it was this interesting intersection of Internet of Things, of mobile, of enterprise software, and the opportunity to go in and really rethink an industry. Um, parking is one of those industries that has not seen a whole lot of innovation in decades. You know, the most exciting thing that had happened in the last 10 years was the introduction of the credit card meter. And so it was, it was one of those things where I was like, huh, this is really a chance to go deep. At SAP, I'd had the experience of, you know, being exposed to the technology, talking at it, you know, about it at a very broad level. And this is really a chance to come in and kind of take this idea and, and bring it to life in a very tangible way. Um, and so would I do it again? Absolutely. Um, for me, this has been you know, a master's class every day where we're trying to get this, this technology to work in the real world. There are good days, there are bad days. Every day we are learning, every day we are applying what we learned from one city to another city. Um, it, is, you know, it is a wild ride, but it is an amazing ride because I feel like we're actually impacting the industry. We're having impact on you know, all of us in this room. If we can tackle parking, that's pretty darn cool. Cool. So, so um, last question for you, Ayaz, and then we're going to open it up to the audience for, 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 for their questions. But, you know, your, your focus is on platform development, and, and you see a lot of components that, that, that go in and building the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Are there gaps that are obvious right now that, that, that companies can go around uh, building technologies to that, that, that you see that people aren't spending enough time on? So if, if you've been in the platform space for some time, the classic thinking in the platform space, and this is for every startup to evaluate whether they want to build 
on top of a, of a platform and deliver some specific point solution, or they want to be a completer or an extender of the platform. And that's called the completer-extender principle. So completer is, there is a hole, there's a gap, right? And, and it's a critical piece. So you talked about security. And it's in, well, I, well I, my answer might have seemed flippant. They could have, it's easy for me to not post pictures on Facebook because it's a choice I can make. Right? But if, if I'm driving somewhere and somebody's recording that information, that's not a choice I can make. So now that's, that's a classic example of a solution that can come in, either as a point solution to avoid that kind of a thing or to provide that capability in the platform to turn those things off. So I can decide, define, so for me right now, if I was to leave this and go start something, I'd start something in the cloud that allows enterprise to trust. Pretty, pretty straightforward. So enterprise trust meaning? Trust any solution trust applications the, the, that are coming the, in. The, trust the data, trust the yeah. service, trust. Yeah. That's an example of okay. something that's a gap today. Then there's places you can extend by adding new, I can, I can extend by taking the platform and putting it into an industry for oil and gas or for sports or for some specific thing, or even extend the core capabilities of the platform where it's it stands on its own, doesn't need the extension, but works much better with the extension. You take, uh, you take uh, as an example, I mean, Nike, Fitbit, yours, you, you have a lot of this. I, I just looked at the iPhone charger, the new one with the extended battery life. Mm -hmm. Phone works just fine without it, but as an extension to that platform, it's a pretty good thing. Sure. Okay. So, so let's open it up to the audience. And uh, um, we have microphones uh, uh, traveling around. Uh, over there, uh, uh, actually, we've got a bunch of people. So first hand I saw was over there. And then we'll bring it over here. Hi, my name is Nahid, and I work alongside uh, uh, Faraz in at and um, The question, this question is for Kelly. Kelly, um, Streetline, it's an excellent example of a vertical, choosing a vertical and going deep into the vertical. But the platform that you have built, I can see a lot of use cases of having sensors in the ground and managing that infrastructure, and then doing something intelligent with the data that you get out of the data. How is a company, how do you see expanding beyond just the first use case that you picked up? And then how you are seeing what the market is asking for if you have any other customers from other verticals? I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, Thanks. Great, great question. Um, so one of the reasons we specifically chose parking was because, you know, again, it's the second or third lar largest revenue source for a city. So if, if I'm a city leader and I'm thinking about this IOT journey, I want to become a connected city, I want to become a smart city, where am I going to place my first bets? Odds are I'm going to start to look at those areas that can really have meaningful impact on my revenue. Um, and so parking fits that, that bill. Once the infrastructure is in place, you can then add other sensing types. So if you start with parking, you can then turn on temperature, you can turn on sound, you can turn on light, you can turn on smart garbage cans. Um, it's really hard to lead with you know, smart garbage cans because eh, is there a real ROI there? Is it kind of cool? Yeah, but it's not something that, that you can really stand up in front of your constituency or city council and say, you know, we're going to bet big that smart garbage cans are a game changer for our city. So we were pretty thoughtful about the use case that we started in. And again, once the infrastructure is in place, it's a lot easier to go back in and, and add other sensing types. In terms of Streetline and where we're headed, um, we've recently introduced uh, moves into temperature, which I've talked a little bit about, as well as sound. And so it's not the kind of sound sensing that can you know, detect the conversation we're having right now. But you know, imagine a real estate scenario. You're out there looking for a home, debating between several different locations. The ambient noise is important. Are you in an air, air, airplane path? Are you close to a freeway? Is this block going to have more ambient noise than that block? Noise ordinances are one of the top um, complaints that come into a, three, a city's 311 service. If you can detect where the noise violations are coming from, you can respond to those easy, much faster and decrease those inquiries from your constituents. Um, so the idea is to get the network in place and build on it from there. And so, I mean, you know, we're, we're familiar with examples at AT&T of companies that, like, like ShotSpot, which um, will listen into uh, ambient noise and detect gunshots so they can then uh, send a, a, a police over to, to an affected area as well. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe that's another example of, of, yeah. of using the, the same sensors. Um, we had a question here. 
Hi, my name is Sadia, and this question is for Kelly. Uh, I think you've partially answered the question, but I still, most of your customers tend to be city and local governments, mm -hmm. and from what we know of governments, they tend to be very slow. So how do you run a startup in that scenario where it could take them months and years before they even make a decision? Yeah, great question. Um, so it is no secret that working with cities can be a challenge. Um, cities operate, they all operate very differently. They typically are not flush with extra cash sitting around to spend on new technology. Um, and so that has been a challenge. Um, and all of us that have come to the company have look at, looked at that as an op an entrepreneurial opportunity. This is an opportunity to innovate. And so what we have done is we've really tried to spend a lot of time with those customers to, to really think how can we change this model. Um, and some of the, the mayors that we've been sitting down with have been really pushing us hard. Um, Mayor Villaragosa um, and um, now Mayor Garcetti down in LA in particular have been very forward thinking in how they can use technology to rethink their city and um, Mayor Garcetti recently posed the question to us, you know, why is it that we've always assumed that parking is an issue that only a city is responsible for solving? And it was a pretty profound question because parking impacts not only the city, it, it impacts all of us every day, it impacts the merchants. And so that has really led us to have other conversations. So we've been talking to merchants, we've been talking to downtown associations, and there's some very interesting models starting to emerge. So in one city, we have a scenario where the city funded the deployment in an area of the community that they were looking to revitalize. The deployment area stopped about two, two blocks short of where an entrepreneur was coming in to establish a new brewery. He got wind of the project and was like, oh my gosh, this could be a differentiator for my business. Mm -hmm. He personally contributed to expanding the deployment area near his business so he could offer parking as a service to differentiate from the other restaurant across town. That's really interesting public-private partnership. Um, we're starting to see more of those kinds of things emerge. We have a university campus where the students decided that parking was such a pain point for them, they actually took it upon themselves to increase their transportation mm -hmm. fee by 20, 25 cents per student to pay for the installation of the infrastructure. So the university didn't absorb the cost. The students decided that this was important enough to them that they were willing to each pay a quarter for the year to have the service in place. So I think the, the other really exciting thing about IoT is it does open up these new ways of thinking about how to solve some of our community problems and shift the way the funding um, has been previously handled. But for cities, this goes beyond IoT as well. So I think one dead giveaway, if you start scanning cities, is if they've hired a CIO or a chief innovation officer. Yep. So San Francisco has a gentleman named Jay Nath, who's a chief in a, a CIO of, he's the CIO of San Francisco City. And we sat down with him, he's interested in our startups, the ones that he wants to bring the startups in. So now instead of having to go through this long process of what typically would have been through all the bureaucrats, they've got a shortcut into straight pilots with the city for not just parking, but for water management, a whole bunch of solutions that the city is interested in, including housing, rents, uh, cheaper way to get uh, cabs, all of that stuff. Everything that they can think of that is useful to the city. Fantastic. Um, we'll go two more questions, so there and then here. Go ahead. Hi, um, thank you for an awesome presentation. My name is Yahya. Um, my question is related to IoT and um, the data analytics part of it itself. So um, in the models for Streetline and um, the farming model that you gave, um, they're sensors with certain parameters and they have particular outcome for which they're optimized, right? But then there was a previous uh, session we were talking about where um, Osama Bidir was saying in his own house he has 56 different um, uh, connected devices. So in a system where it's really complex uh, and where it's pretty dynamic between um, different individuals, um, do you guys know of any um, uh, strategies aside from what you'd use for the particular scenario where it's a uh, defined system? Um, in a complex system where you basically have to have self-optimize for the individual, what are some uh, analytic strategies that make those networks intelligent? So, it's a, that's a great question. Now, you, what, you've, what you're talking about is essentially a networked situation, each one where each node has its own intelligence. Now, you may, you may decide that uh, you're doing simple analytics post-op after an event has happened. That's your standard analytics tools today, whether it's, whether it's uh, reactive, 
and that's most of your analytics tools today will tell you something has happened and you are going to react to it. Whether it's proactive, it tells you something's about to take place or something in the, next, in the near future. Those are, so you have to choose the strategy based on what we are seeing now with the advent of this uh, large amount of data being stored and managed is companies are more interested in the math problems, the predictive problems. And uh, as you start pulling all of these different pieces together, it goes from being reactive to proactive to now more predictive. And that's sort of been, as you start getting more and more of these nodes together, the analytics moves largely towards predictive. You'll see most of the startups in the space, in fact, VCs are funding quite a few of the predictive analytics startups. The, if you think of the reactive and the proactive ones, those games have sort of stopped, if you will. It's like people not funding anything other than cloud deployments, if you will. So large number of VCs, entrepreneurs, are focusing largely on the predictive space. But it all depends on your use case. Again, for your house, and, and specific to house, you may have a, a proactive and a reactive may be good enough. Because it, it's a very different use case. Your water pump's about to break a reactive or a proactive one's good enough. I don't care about a prediction. It'll break in two years. That's fine. So, so I can add a little bit to that you know, from my vantage point at, at AT&T. So, um, you know, Every home now has multiple networks in it, right? You've got your Wi-Fi network, you've got your television coming through IP, you've got data networks into it, you've now got home automation networks through ZigBee, Z-Wave types of things. Every single one of those needs some form of administration. And expecting homeowners to be their own network admins is perhaps an unrealistic and an unfair expectation. Um, to Osama's point earlier in the previous panel, yeah, I have about 80 devices that have an IP address in my house right now um, across different um, um, uh, communication protocols. And yes, I can manage that, but why is that not managed service coming from my service provider? Mm -hmm. Or is, is that an area where, where we can where there's ripe uh, times for, for innovation? Last question was over there, and um, then we'll wrap it up. How you doing? I'm uh, Jerry Higgs. Uh, and this question can probably be answered by both of you all, but Kelly, you kind of led me to this question where you was talking about the sensors were self-aware that you were able to do rolling uh, updates. But one of the major problems when you update a device, even like your cell phone, sensor, anything, is temporarily is not usable. Were you all able to overcome that barrier of making these sensors to still be able to have the ability to transmit data while they're being updated? Or if not, what is your kind of workaround to still allow you to capture that data? Yeah, very good question. Um, so unlike a phone, for example, when you're doing the updates, it does, it's, not a, it's not a black and white situation. Um, so there's a couple different ways we typically approach it. If it's a large update, um, then it would be a rolling process where you wouldn't take down the whole network all at once to do it. And it would be more of a rolling process. Or if there's a case like, say, a university, where we know because of the historical data that there is a decrease in utilization of the, the network and the, and the information, we may choose to do something at off-peak times. Um, so it, it really depends d based on the specific deployment. And fortunately, we have the information to be able to understand um, what the best approach is given you know, that city's situation or that university's situation. What we're seeing also now, now some of the newer sensors, is they have the failover right built into the sensor. So they have a, they have a backup right in there that, that they go into while one is being updated and then you do the switch. The switch is, is just a minimal amount of time once you've already updated the, the old sensor, if you will. It's just a swap. Happens. So with that, I would like to thank our panelists, um, Ayaz and Kelly. Thank you so much for, for spending your time with us. Thank you, everyone here. Thank you, Open.